Good morning, good morning to you all. It's just so hard to believe that it's August already and this year just seems to be flying past and it seems as though we're marking time as well. But, but this morning I'd like to start just a little bit differently. I'd like to read to us from Psalm 25 where David writes and says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths and lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all day. And so I light this candle as a symbol of God's presence with us here this morning. Um, as we, we look at his word. Let's pray together. Father, please be with us as we look at your word this morning. Please guide our thinking and guide our thoughts. Lord, this morning I just pray for those who are sick. I ask you, Lord, to please send your word and heal them. Please guide our leaders, Father. Protect our frontline workers. Help them, protect them and be with them and their families as they worry about them. Be with us now, Lord, as we look at your word and explore just a little bit more in the name of Jesus. Amen. We will be having communion at the end of the service. And so please pause now and go and get your communion elements, light a candle. Um, and be ready to join me in communion a little bit later on. We, we're continuing our series by John Ortberg of All the Places to Go, and today we're looking at some of the myths that we believe as gospel, um, and they become part of our lives, and, and without us even thinking about them, they, they actually influence us and, and how we think. And Nan was grading some papers, and, and these were some of the answers that she read. Uh, the statements were written by the children and have, have not been retouched or corrected, and, and the incorrect spelling has been left in them. Imagine this poor nun's face when she read some of these answers. So some of these things go. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. God got tired of creating the world, so he took the Sabbath off. Another one was Adam and Eve were created from an apple tree. Noah's wife was Joan of Ark and Noah built the ark and the animals came in, came on board in pairs. P-E-A-R-S. Moses led the Jews to the Red Sea where they made unleavened bread, which is bread without any ingredients. All the Egyptians were drowned in the desert. Afterwards, Moses went up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. Oh my goodness me. The first commandment was when Eve told Adam to eat the apple. Isn't that the truth? Though? <laughs> Jesus enunciated the golden rule which says, do unto others before they do one to you. He also explained that man does not live by sweat alone. Now how about this one? The epistles were the wives of the apostles. Um, I just can't help but giggle. And the last one. Christians have only one spouse. They call this monotony. Um, it's all just good for a giggle. But on a more serious note, we've all heard people say things and convince us that it's in the Bible, like, this too will pass. Well, it's not in the Bible. It sounds biblical, but it's not actually in the Bible. And and what about God helps those who help themselves? It sounds good, but let me tell you, it's not in the scriptures. It's definitely not there. Or we hear, God will not give you more than you can handle. Have you heard that one? <clears throat> the Bible does not say that God will not allow someone to be tempted beyond what they can stand, but the Bible 
never said that God will not allow you to be given more than you can handle. People are given more than they can handle all the time. And you and I probably are there right at the moment. People think that it's scriptural. Well, it's not. Here are some more things that are not in the Bible. Spare the rod and spoil the child. That's not in the Bible. That's a good English proverb. Uh, what about God moves in mysterious ways? That's an old song, but it's not in the Bible. Or what about two hesitations for verse 3? That's also not in the Bible. It's not there. Um, nor is the book of Moses. Um, oh, or what about when God closes a door, he opens a window. This is from the script of Sound of Music, said by Mother Superior. It's not in the Bible. There are so many variations of that one. But in my opinion, the best is when God closes a door, Julie Andrews opens a window. But what the Bible does say is in Revelation 3, verse 7. God opens a door that no one can shut. And when he shuts a door, no one can open it. The first door that we really read about in the Bible is found in Genesis 3 verse 24. Adam and Eve had sinned and God asked them to leave the Garden of Eden. And then he placed an angel there with a flaming sword. There's nothing in that passage that says God then opened a window so that they could sneak back in. The whole idea of God closing a door is that he is saying to us, don't go there. Closed doors did not enter into our way of thinking until sin crept into this world. But the God we serve is a God who loves to open doors for us. God opens doors for us that open unlimited chances to do something worthwhile. Grand openings into new adventures of significant living, unimagined chances to do something good and to make our lives count for eternity. But it is exactly this. Doors are about the future and the possibilities and they intersect deeply with our desires and involve the mysterious ways in which God interacts with the world. And our ideas about divine doors can be full of misconceptions and superstition. Sometimes we turn our wishes into some form of spirituality. Sometimes we try and manipulate God or we use him as our genie in the bottle. I think we need to remember that we serve a holy God and sometimes we need to change our way of thinking. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And his ways are far higher or far greater than what our ways are. Sometimes we uh, have the misconception that we feel that God is not involved in our little lives. We think that we are too insignificant. I think about Sarah Barbel, um, the guy who was, who was going to get the temple rebuilt after all those many years in exile in Babylon. He only managed a meagre start and was quickly overwhelmed by opposition from outside and from depression from inside. And then we read from Zechariah 4 verse 10 where, where the Lord says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. What about the little boy who goes to hear the great teacher? And his mother packs him a lunch pack of five loaves and two fish. No one in that crowd looked more insignificant than this little chap. Yet when the disciples were looking for food, the thought flashed through the little boy's mind. He could share what he had. 
His small gift in the hands of the Saviour would be spoken of for all time and for time to come. What about the poor widow who passed the temple treasury box? She places in to that box the only thing that she had, two small coins. Could this make a difference? From a human perspective, no. But from a heavenly perspective, yes, oh yes, it could make a difference. Please don't despise the day of small things. None of us know what is small in the eyes of the Lord. Spiritual size is not measured in the same way as physical size. What unit will you use? to measure love? This is a question I've really been thinking about in the last little while. We don't have that yardstick. No project is so great that it doesn't need God. And no project is so small that it doesn't interest God. When we are born, our world is very small. And as we grow, it may, might become quite large. And if we live long enough and grow old enough, our worlds become small again. And if we don't learn to find God in our small world, we're never going to find Him at all. Mother Teresa said, don't try to do great things for God. Do small things with great love. Jesus mostly did small things. He spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well. She was just a disgraced prostitute. He hung out with children so important that the disciples tried to shoo them away. His final miracle before the crucifixion was to replace the sliced ear of, of Caiaphas' servant. We have no idea what is big or small in the sight of God. But what I do know is that I will never go through a big door if I do not humble myself to the task of discerning and entering all the small ones. Please don't despise the day of small things. For that too is the day that the Lord has made. And that is where I'm going to find him. Another myth that continually confronts us is, if I can't tell which door to choose, then either God um, is not revealing something to me, or I've got something wrong. We've all heard this, learned this the hard way. When I have a big decision to make, the choices are very, really simple. Uh, like when choosing a, a vacation, or having to change jobs, or having to relocate. How often have we just asked, please God, if you will just speak to me and tell me plainly what to do. You see, primarily God's will for our lives is the person we become. God wants us to become the best me I can be. We as parents want that for our children too. Just to become the best that they can be is what we want for our children. And God wants that for me, to be the best me I can be. God cares about every aspect of my life. But the only one aspect that's of the utmost importance importance is that I become the person who is best, the best representation of me. God does not throw thunderbolts at us when we choose incorrectly. He gently nudges us in the right direction and helps us to become the people he wants us to be. We pray for guidance and he willingly gives that to each and every one of us freely and willingly. Another myth 
that confronts me is that if it's really an open door, my circumstances will be easy. Please bury that. Life does not become easy just because I'm a believer. Just because I'm a believer doesn't mean that my marriage, my job, my finances, my everything will be easy. If easy is my criterion for judging doors, then every time I hit hard, I will be filled with doubt about the Lord. Generally, when the Lord calls me through an open door, life gets a little bit harder. Abraham encountered hard. Moses encountered hard. What about David and Joseph? I can go on. What about Jesus? The truth is that we are able to face trouble without being troubled. I read in John 16 verse 33, I realize that, that Jesus prepares me for this. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. When things get hard, just hear the Lord tell you to stand up for justice. You see, evil prevails when good people do nothing. It's hard to stand up. But please will you dress yourself in the armour of God. Read it in Ephesians chapter 6 and then stand. Easy does not describe my, my problems, rather it describes the strength from beyond myself with which I can carry my problems. Jesus offers us the peace that comes from the inside and the joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. Some people believe that open doors come, that come from God are about spiritual success and spiritual giants. And this is so far from the truth. Open doors are mostly small, quiet invitations to do something humble for God. An open door is generally a door to serve, to give, to repent, a door to be honest. Often an open door is as simple as a second thought to do the right thing, no matter how small. Honour the commitments you make. If a door is not marked with glamorous things, then just settle for obedient. Some believe that there's always a right door for every decision. Please forget that. There isn't. If you're going to believe that, you're not going to get past breakfast most days. Some believe that God will not force them through a door that they don't like. But again, that is a myth. Pharaoh didn't want to let the people of Israel go. But holding on to them was very hard. Saul did not want to be king. But the crown came anyway. Jeremiah tries to get God to give the office of prophet to someone else. But there were no takers. Jonah tried to run, or, or should I rather say sail away. But God brought him back. And you and me, when God calls you to do something, that call is irrevocable. And you would do good to obey that still small voice that comes when you least expect it. God uses so many things to bring us to the place where he can use us. And it's often not what we want to hear. So what then is the truth? If those are all myths, what then is the truth? The story goes of a professor who invited some of his top students to come to his home for a cup of coffee. And he had intentionally put out a whole array of different coffee cups on the table, different shapes, different sizes, some new, some old, some chipped, some not. And he made coffee for his students. He invites them to, to get up and, and come and fetch their coffee. And instantly they reach for the better looking mugs. After they've had their coffee, the professor says to them, you, 
instantly reached out for the mug that looked better. But the coffee inside each cup is the same. The same amount of love and care went into making each cup. There's no difference. So often we pay more attention to the outside than to the inside. We are all attracted to good looks, to pomp and splendour. And sometimes we pay very little attention to what's going on on the inside. God is interested on the inside. This is what counts for him. It's not what we look like, but how we feel and what we think that is important to God. The truth comes in Revelation 3 that God opens a door that no one can shut and God shuts a door that no one can open. When all is in lockdown and it feels as though no one can get in, then Jesus comes in. And I read this in John chapter 20 verse 19. It says, when it was evening and all the doors of the house where the disciples met had been locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. A week later, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was there with them and although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. You see, that's the truth. The truth is that Jesus never leaves us alone. The truth is that he loves us so much that he will never leave us to do anything on our own. The truth is that he is with us all the time. And when we go through that door that seems to be wrong, when I'm faced with difficulties that seem insurmountable, then Jesus is there with me. He stands with me and he speaks his peace into my life. That is the truth. The truth is that he has said he will never leave us or let us go. The myths are fun to believe, but at the end of the day, please remember one thing, that he loves you with a love that will never end. Come, let's have communion together. Peace of the Lord be with you. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks over the bread, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks over the cup, he gave it to them and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. And Christ will come again. And so, Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, but it is your nature always to have mercy, and on this we depend. So feed us today, Lord, with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might ever live in him, and he in us, world without end. Father God, pour out your Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine, that they might truly be for us, the body and blood of your Son. Lord, feed us until we hunger no more. Let us drink until we thirst no more. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you've invited us to your banquet. 
Thank you for feeding us. Thank you for sustaining us. Lord, help us to read and understand your word in such a way that we would not fall for the myths that surround, but rather that we would hang on to the truth. The truth is that you left the comfort of heaven to come to this earth to die for us so that we can live. So thank you for that. Thank you God for loving us so much that you can't take your eyes off us. Thank you for loving us with an, with an unending love. And so Lord I ask that you bless every person who's watching the sermon today. That you would speak to us, Lord, and tell us what you would have us do. Help us to walk through the door. In Jesus' name. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every one of you now and forevermore. Amen. I'm looking forward to the webinar that we have for women tomorrow evening at 7.30 um, on gender-based violence. And if you can possibly join us, I'd really love to have you there with us. Um, I'm looking forward to, to sharing with you again next Sunday morning. From my home to yours, God bless and keep you. Amen.